أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا من يرتد منكم عن دينه فسوف يأتي الله بقوم يحبهم ويحبونه ويحبونه أذلة على المؤمنين عزة على الكافرين يهجاهدون في سبيل الله ولا يخافون لومة لائم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله واسع عليم إنما وليكم الله ورسوله والذين آمنوا الذين يقيمون الصلاة ويؤتون الزكاة وهم راكعون ومن يتولى الله ورسوله والذين آمنوا فإن حزب الله هم الكافرون يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتخذوا الذين اتخذوا دينكم هزوا ولعبا من الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم والكفار أولياء واتقوا الله إن كنتم مؤمنين صدق الله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful Surah 5, The Food Verses 54 to 57 O you who believe, whoever from among you turns, turns back from his religion then Allah will bring a people he shall love them, and they shall love him. Lowly before the believers, mighty against the unbelievers. They shall strive hard in Allah's way, and shall not fear the censure of any censurer. This is Allah's grace. He gives it to whom he pleases. Allah is giving, knowing. Only Allah is your vali, and his apostle, and those who believe. Those who keep up prayers, and pay the poor rate while they bow. And whoever takes Allah and his apostle, and those who believe for a guardian, then surely the party of Allah are they that shall be triumphant. O you who believe, do not take for guardians those who take your religion for a mockery and a joke. From among those who are given the book before you and the unbelievers, and be careful of your duty to Allah if you are believers. Salwat. Uh, next, we have a uh, Qasida by uh, Brother Dhulfiqar Chauhan. So, can we welcome him up with a loud salawat? Salawat. Na Delhi Parite Raho Hamashwara Motaram. Na Delhi Parite Raho Hamashwara Motaram Na Delhi Parite Raho Pasa Sakeng Pernagam Na Delhi Parite Raho Kasi bhi ho mushkil ghari Sar pe musibat ho khari Kasi bhi ho mushkil ghari Sar pe musibat ho khari 
टल जाएंगे रंजो अलम नादयली पढ़ते रहो किश्ती गिरी जब नूह की हातिफ ने आवाज दी किश्ती गिरी जब नूह की हातिफ ने आवाज दी तूफान जाए गाए थम नाद अली पढ़ते रहो है मशवरा मोहतरम नाद अली पढ़ते रहो जिक्र अली बाद तेरी बन जाए काद तेरी जिक्र अली बाद तेरी बन जाए काद तेरी ये जिंदगी न हो जाए कम नाद अली पढ़ते रहो है मशवरा मोहतरम नाद पढ़ते रहो तुरबत से हम डरते नहीं जन्नत तलब करते नहीं तुरबत से हम डरते नहीं जन्नत तलब करते नहीं पढ़ते हुए निकले ये दम नाद पढ़ते रहो है मशवरा मोहतरम नाद पढ़ते रहो जब मार का खैबर का था अहमद से खालिक ने कहा जब मार का खैबर का था अहमद से खालिक ने कहा पहुँचेंगे है दर एक दम नाद पढ़ते रहो है मशवरा मोहतरम नाद पढ़ते रहो पास सकेंगे फिर नगम नाद पढ़ते रहो नाद पढ़ते रहो नाद अली पढ़ते रहो सलवाद फॉलो इन द फुट स्टेप्स ऑफ इमाम अली गाइडेड बाय इमाम अली इन चैरिटी बाय अली किमजी फियर अल्लाह व्हेन द क्वेश्चन ऑफ हेल्पलेस ऑर्फन्स अराइजेस यू शुड नेवर लेट देम स्टार्व सो लॉन्ग एज यू आर देयर टू गार्ड एंड प्रोटेक्ट देम दे शुड नॉट बी रूइंड और लॉस्ट Uh, elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, As-salamu alaykum. Um, now, I've been asked today to talk about how Imam Ali has inspired me in my charity work. But I'm going to start by quoting something from Shakespeare. Uh, so rest assured, it will soon all make sense. What's in a name, asks Juliet of Romeo in Shakespeare's infamous love story. But while Juliet goes on to proclaim that names are an artificial and meaningless convention, much of humanity looks to their name to looks to their own name to give them a connection to the world around them many muslims are named after heroes from islamic history to hark back to that golden age where is, when islam was practiced in its purest form in this vein i look to the figure that i was named after ali ibn abi talib 
for guidance in my own life. Now, most of us should be familiar with the story of um, Imam Ali giving charity whilst in prayer. But just to recap, the story that goes that, the beggar, that a beggar entered the Prophet's mosque and went round to the faithful to ask for donations. After everyone turned him away, he raised his hands towards the heavens and said, God, be a witness that I came to your Prophet's mosque and nobody gave me anything. Ali was in Ruku at the time and God ordered him to give the beggar something. So he sticks out his little finger which had a ring on it and the beggar comes forward to take the ring. What's remarkable, about, uh, what's remarkable about this story is that if today someone is to walk into, around a mosque with a charity bucket and someone stuck out a donation in the middle of their prayer, everyone would assume that the person had broken their prayer to give the money. But set aside the fact that Ali was acting under divine command, and we can explore this action in a little more detail. Not only was he fulfilling his private obligation to God through rituals, but at the same time he was performing an act of charity that benefited the society around him. Too often today do Muslims focus on the ritualistic side of the faith and negate our duties to wider humanity. Now, there are countless stories of Ali going out of his way to help those who are needy, thirsty, without clothing or shelter, or who are in debt. He helped widows, orphans, the elderly, and the disabled. His thirst for social justice knew no bounds, and anyone who fell into his path was guaranteed a helping hand. His commitment to charity is best illustrated through his own lifestyle. He lived as, as an ascetic and, as, and owned no goods of his own. He proclaimed that God had made it obligatory on religious leaders to live like the impoverished, uh, so that the poor man's burden of poverty was not unbearable for him. Furthermore, Ali was not one of those religious clerics who, lo who locks himself up in a seminary and preaches that we shouldn't be concerned around, about the welfare of the wor world around us. He actively fought so for social justice to make the world a better place for those around him. There is another story of two women who go to the public treasury to collect payment. Uh, one was an Arab and the other was a non-Arab, and Ali gave them each an equal share. Now, some people in the community questioned this, as they hadn't quite grasped the concept of, humanity of, uh, of the equality of humanity that Islam preaches. Now, but Ali just dismisses them and says that he found no difference between the two women. Furthermore, charity isn't just restricted to giving money. It can be a gift of time or the contribution of your skill set. The Prophet Muhammad is quoted as saying that charity is enjoining good, forbidding evil, removing harm from the road, leading the blind, guiding, and guiding one to the object of his need. We can't also forget the famous hadith that even a smile is charity. Now, I wanted to tell you about Al-Mizan Charitable Trust, which is a charity that I have been working with for the past year and a half. We provide grants and interest-free loans to disadvantaged individuals and deprived communities across the UK in order to give them a helping hand out of poverty. Now, poverty is a very relative word, so our definition of poverty is being unable to maintain a dignified existence in society. The people who we help have been marginalized and outcast from their own communities, and we are helping them to build the confidence to reintegrate back into that community. Some of our grants cover food costs or for clothing. Others are for simple household goods, such as a washing machine or bed. We've had a rise in people applying for funds to cover vocational courses as they seek new employment, having made, made redundant after, during the deepening financial crisis. It's also worth pointing out that we fund anyone regardless of their faith or cultural, faith or cultural background. In fact, we don't even look at that section on their application form. All we care about is helping those who are most in need. You might say that international aid projects serve a better use, as they help those who are living in absolute poverty. But if we continue to have a weak Muslim community in this country, then we won't have the economic ability to, to support those international aid projects. But above all, charity begins at home. As well as our grants and interest-free loans, we are also launching a Zakat Fund, which is aimed at helping Muslim prisoners with mental health conditions, uh, ex-offenders through their rehabilitation back into the community, and families of prisoners. We believe in giving everyone a second chance in life, and a lack of support is one of the primary reasons for prisoners re-offending and being sent back behind bars. We are also hoping to launch a food bank within Brenton Harrow that every week will provide food for those who cannot afford it and are on benefits. It's beyond belief that a human being can be put in a situation where they cannot afford the basic necessity of food in a developed country like our own. I grew up hearing the many stories of Ali and indeed the Prophet Muhammad who helped anyone and everyone they could. And this had a far-reaching far effect on me than I could ever have imagined in creating this desire within me to carry on the fight for social justice. But it saddens me that much of the Muslim community doesn't feel the same way and restricts charitable giving to only during the month of Ramadan or will only contribute to religious projects. Now, there are many quotes from the many sermons of Ali that revolve around the subject of charity, 
and giving. But I wanted to end on one in particular, which is, do not feel ashamed if the amount of charity is small, because to refuse the needy is an act of greater shame. Thank you very much. Following the footsteps of Imam Ali, guided by Imam Ali in knowledge by Imran Ali Panjwani. The best knowledge is that which benefits the listener. The knowledge which does not benefit anybody is useless, not valuable, and not worth learning and remembering. Naja Balaga, Sermon 31. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum my dear brothers and sisters and Jazakallah for this very humble opportunity to speak about Imam Ali and really it is an honour to share whatever small and humble research I'm uh, engaging with with regards to him. I have been asked basically just to talk for a few minutes about some of the things practically that we can learn from Imam Ali linked to my research. I want to actually begin with a quote. It's by uh, Dr. Henry Stubb. Uh, this is an 18th century quote in his book, uh, An Account of the Rise and Progress of Mahometism. It's quite an old book. He describes our dear Ali salam, in the following way. He says that Ali uh, had a contempt for the world, its glory and its pomp. He feared God in all of his actions. He was just in all of his actions. He gave a lot in charity. Uh, he was humble. He was affable, meaning likable. He had an exceedingly quick wit and he concentrated on those sciences that dealt with practicalities, not on those sciences that terminated in speculations. To me, this is one of the most heartfelt and wonderful quotes about our first Imam. The reason that I say this is, I think the Muslim community uh, and generally scholarship can have a tendency to look at theoretical subjects and theoretical problems. If you look today, we face a number of issues. Uh, internet technology, Facebook, human rights, coming up with frameworks of justice and uh, leadership, uh, the problems of the economy, state of education. All of these things are actually uh, issues which Imam al-Islam dealt with in his own time. I'm not saying that history contains everything and that we can find every single piece of information with what the Imam is doing but we can find seeds of growth we can find points where we can go back to and develop models and frameworks my question to you is have we really used Najul Balaga the peak of eloquence in its entirety to develop frameworks and models for humanity Part of my PhD research at King's College London is based on that. I'm focusing actually on the role of the self in human rights, looking at Najo Balaga and Rizal al Hukuk. The reason that I pose you this question is, and some of you may know this, we do have some classical commentaries in existence. We have the very famous commentary by Ibn Abi al-Hadid on Najo Balaga, which deals with the content and the language of the sermons. We have uh, commentaries dealing with the sources of Najo Balaga. But my question is, do we have commentaries which deal with the framework that we can build from Najo Balaga to actually produce solutions for humanity's problems? I want to focus on three in the short time, just to give you a flavor of the research and what I'm talking about. The first is the state of education in uh, the Western society and in general. What is happening at the moment and what is happening, especially the last 10 years, Education has been focusing on curriculum development, on teachers' training, on administrative methods, on, and on statistics and on modular frameworks. Now, all of this streamlines education. It makes education compartmentalized, which means that if you learn biology and you learn philosophy, those two will never interact. You learn history and you learn law, but again, those two will never interact. It's a reductionist epistemology to education. Previously, many, many centuries ago, even during the Imam's time, you even find during Al-Baqan and Asadik's time, they were basically polymaths. That means people that educated themselves in fiqh as well as theology, in chemistry and maths, as well as hadith. You don't find that today. Of course, people like Ibn Asina and Ghazali were like that. 
When it comes to the state of education, the other problem is instrumentality. You become educated for what? Good A-levels, go to university, get a good degree, and that's all for a job and good money and good lifestyle. Is that really what education is about? I'm posing this question because even when we look not just at the universal education, look at madrasa. Our madrasa syllabus, and I'm not just talking about Shias, but Muslims in general, has remained the same for many, many years, even since we have migrated into the United Kingdom. So, for example, when you look at the way we teach fiqh, and you look at uh, hadith, you look at uh, the way we teach Quran, all of it deals with the externalities of religion. Now, externalities of religion acquaint you only with the outer framework, not with the inner framework. So, again, madrasas tend to produce a Muslim that is not necessarily intimately connected with the essence and message of religion. And then you look at the Hosea tradition, a very rich tradition, and Alhamdulillah, it's a great tradition. And we have majored in subjects like fiqh and hadith and tafsir and irfan and falsafa to varying degrees. Most of the emphasis has been on fiqh. But do we teach anthropology, sociology, bioethics, internet technology, politics in the Hosea? No, we don't. So what is happening is, we find positives and negatives from each angle. Where can Imamani contribute a great solution for this? Something which I have been working on the last six months is letter 31 of Nahju Balaga. In that letter, Imam al-Islam gives advice to his son, Hassan and Hussein alayhi salam. He tells his sons uh, that before he dies, he tells his sons, reflect on the world, reflect on calamities, Reflect on people that have trodden paths. When you suffer, be patient. Reflect on death. He even tells them that he felt that he had taught them Quran, but that was not enough. He wanted to tell them more about akhlaq, ethics and good living. Can you believe this? He even tells them about a spiritual principles such as fearing Allah and trusting God. To me, this letter gives us a model of education where I feel this book can influence education, and I mean that in the broadest and universal sense possible, is to give life models, life training and spiritual training to individuals. For example, if you look today, we face depression, we face knife crime and gang crime and all of these things. Education cannot just be secular. Education cannot just be spiritual. There has to be an amalgamation of the two. And therefore, letter 31, gives us seeds to show how Imam Islam amalgamated these principles together. Two other issues. The second, issues of leadership. If you look at governments, one of the biggest things which faces them and what is complained by indigenous people and by third world countries is double standards. People uh, claim or governments claim, especially in the West, well, we are championing human rights. But at the same time, they will bomb another country to instill a government or they will bomb a government for oil. Is this how leadership should be? Even in our own Muslim communities, or even non-Muslim communities, it doesn't matter whether we're a Muslim organization or non-Muslim organization. If we say, La ilaha illallah, but at the same time we engage in politics, and we are doing injustices to others, or if we're a non-Muslim organization, and in fact we may be better, or at the same time we may be doing injustices, it means the moral framework behind our, our organization is not stable. The famous letter to Malik al letter 53, has not really been looked at in any depth. Yes, it was submitted to the United, the United Nations, but so what? It has to have a practical value. Why can't we develop a 10-point charter in that advice that uh, Imam al Islam gave to Malik al and see how we can develop community charters which every member of the committee has to sign and that's a government on a national level as well as council level as well as at a community level as well as at a jamaat level if you like where for example uh, the uh, letter can be signed by committee members and they, it's like an, an oath, a declaration, an ethical declaration before you actually engage in a meeting again that's a practical value and the last theme before I end, the value of the Qur'an. Ibn Abi al-Hadid says in his very beautiful commentary, Shah of Naju Balaga, Sermon 176 is amongst the greatest of the sermons of the Qur'an. 
And you know what our first Imam says about the Quran? He says that the Quran is a spiritual advisor. When you sit beside this Quran, you are meant to experience an elevation and an addition in what? In spiritual awareness. And you're meant to experience a diminution or some something being taken away. That means you're meant to experience uh, something which shows you where you are spiritually blind. So it's meant to show you a spiritual elevation and it's meant to take away a spiritual ill. What are these ills? Rebelliousness, hypocrisy, disbelief in misguidance. Let me kindly pose you a question. When we read the Quran, do we experience those things? Have we really looked at the Quran in this way? Again, developing a model and framework of the Quran and teaching it in madrasas and teaching it worldwide to our children and to humanity. These are my humble thoughts about how we can use Naja Balaga and Imam Salam in a practical way. Jazakallah for listening. May Allah bless Ali. May Allah bless Muhammad and his family. May Allah forgive all of our sins and accept our small efforts. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, brothers and sisters, next we have a uh, Qasida by Brother Suhail Walji. Can we welcome him with a loud salawat? Musalmano Natum Ab Ali ka mertaba jane Musalmano na tum ab tak Ali ka mertaba jane Uthaya apne Kiska tha khuda jane Musalmano na tum ab tak Ali ka mertaba jane Ye keh kar mein ki so jau gatur bat me ye keh kar me suku ki neend so jau gatur bat me nishamatam के जाने और निशामतम के जाने और खाके के बला जाने मुसलमानों न तुम अब तक Ali ka mertaba jane Marize la dawa aja Alam ke saaye me aja Marize la dawa aja 
मरीजेला दवा आ जाम के साय में आ जा जाने शिफा जाने मरज जाने शिफा जाने फरेरे की हवा जाने मुसलमानों न तुम अब तक अली कमर तबा जाने मुसलमानों न तुम अब तक अली कमर तबा जाने पर मोहम्मद वाल मोहम्मद सलमान रहे बिरदे जबा शियो न दयाली परे मुश्किल तो कह दो मददियाली रहे बिरदे जबा शियो न दयाली परे मुश्किल तो कह अली के नाम से दोनों जहां में इज्जत है अली का जिक्र है खाले की इतात है अली के नाम से गमगीन दिल को फरहत है करो हक से दुआ तो बना में आली होगी हाजत रवा तो बना में आली परे मुश्किल तो कह दो मदद याली रहे वे दे जबा शियो न दे परे मुश्किल तो कह दो मदद इलाही वास्ता तुझको मोहम्मद मुस्तफा का इलाही वास्ता तुझको अली ये मुर्तजा का इलाही वास्ता हसन कौर फातिमा का रहे महमारा सलामत सदा मोमिनो को न हो कोई रंग जो बला परे मुश्किल तो कह दो मदद याली रहे वे दे जबा 
शियो न दयाली पर मुश्किल तो कह दो मद Follow in the footsteps of Imam Ali, guided by Imam Ali in parenting by Nazmina Virji. From the very beginning, my son, I took care to help you to develop a noble character and to fit you for the life which you will have to lead. To let you grow up to be a young man with a noble character, an open and honest mind, and clear and precise knowledge of things around you. Najil Balaga, Sermon 31. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين My elders and sisters and brothers السلام عليكم To talk about parenting in the footsteps of Imam Ali alayhi salam is quite daunting because I stand here before seasoned parents who have brought up contributing positive strong members of society who i have a lot to learn from myself so in no way is this talk to be taken as a lecture or any kind of opinion on parenting or imam ali alayhi salam these are simply my musings along my relatively short journey of parenting and what i've specifically been impacted by from the teachings of imam ali alayhi salam and specifically letter 31 Um I remember when I had my first child and I became a parent. It was an especially difficult experience knowing what the right thing to do was at all times. Often as I lay awake rocking him back to sleep up to 8 times a night wondering is this the right way to put a child to sleep? What did the Ahlul Bayt do? How did they wean their children? Did they sleep train them? Um how did they discipline them? Did they did their children not have tantrums? did they have time outs um did they encourage three meals a day or simply let them eat when they were hungry um what was their parenting style in the world of parenting that's a very very um common phrase and very quickly i came to realize that there are no such examples no concrete documented accounts of what they did of what they did for me to imitate or copy but that's because that's not what we're supposed to be doing We're supposed to be emulating and inculcating the principles that they taught. And digging deep, I found that there was actually a lot there within their teachings that I could implement. So when giving advice to Imam Hassan alayhi salam um or Muhammad ibn Hanafiya in this letter 31, I noticed that in this letter although he wrote it to adult children, it was so so relevant to what I was trying to instill in my children. He says in there I have made use of early opportunities to educate you and train you before your mind loses its freshness before it gets hardened or warped before you start facing life unprepared for the encounter and before you're forced to use your decisions without gaining advantages of experiences of others So we see here that he takes he takes parenting very seriously and he starts it from a very young age He doesn't leave it to chance that his son will develop a noble character simply by virtue of good pure genes. He actually taught his children and molded them from a young age. He says, "Originally, my desire was only to teach you the holy book thoroughly, to make you understand its intricacies, to impart to you the complete knowledge of his commandments and interdictions, and not to leave you at the mercy of knowledge of other people." But After having succeeded in this task, I felt nervous that I may leave you untrained and uneducated in the subjects which are themselves subject to so much contradiction and confusion. Therefore, I have noted down in these lines the basic principles of nobility, piety, truth, and justice. He says, "You may feel them to be overbearing and harsh, but my desire is to equip you with this knowledge instead of leaving you unarmed to face the world so he actually makes a conscious decision to teach his sons basic principles of nobility piety truth and justice and i found that very very endearing but at the same time i thought to myself it's well and good instilling these principles in them from a young age but then what if everything goes pear shaped 
then they have their tantrums, and then they rebel, and then they have, there's all these problems that you come across. How, what do you do then? And discipline is a topic that baffles parents all the time. How do you discipline? And there's so many parenting manuals written about different styles of discipline. And you'll see, parenting styles are commonly divided into three. So there's the authoritarian parent, who says things like, do as you're told, stop asking so many questions, go to your room, you're grounded for a month, no pocket money for a week, for a month. Who spares no opportunity to show his child who's boss, and manages to get results. Their children are usually dire, but out of compliance, not out of cheerful cooperation out of their own free will. So unless there's a threat of punishment, nothing gets done. And then we have the permissive parents who befriend their children and are themselves unclear about boundaries. They give them menu choices for lunch and dinner. They ask them if they'd like to go to bed. They rescue them from facing pain and hardship, pick them up as soon as they fall down. And they give teachers an earful if they so much as rep reprimand their beloved child. They may pay their children to get good grades or to do simple household chores like the washing up, and their children get away with murder. So unless there's a promise of reward, nothing gets done. Then there are the more enlightened and balanced parents, the likes of us, we hope, who would naturally take the middle path between strictness and extreme affection, where they educate the child instead, instill these virtues in them to make more informed choices, but in the spur of the moment, when faced with a tantrum right on the way to school, as you're coming out of the door and there's a child still in pajamas, this is a lot easier said than done. It's a lot simpler to just bribe them or scare them. But Imam Ali alayhi salam really opened my eyes to an amazing technique of discipline. He mentions time and time again in various sayings and sermons about letting experience be your teacher, about facing consequences of your actions natural consequences of your actions. So about, he says, a man who masters his experiences will be safe from harm, while a man who is devoid of experiences will be blind to consequences. He says to his sons, do not be like people on whom advice has no effect. They require punishment to improve them. A sensible man acquires education through advice and experience, while brutes and beasts always improve through punishment. And that's exactly what modern parenting methods are advocating, to allow children to learn from the natural consequences of their mistakes without added punishment or lectures or I told you so's. So for example, a child who always forgets their PE kit, always forgets their homework, or doesn't do it. The authoritarian parent will nag and plead and threaten and punish and lecture. The permissive parent will dutifully remember it for him or drop it off to school for his child, or make, write a note to the teacher about why he hasn't done his homework. The wise parent, however, sees the forgotten lunch or PE kit as an opportunity for that child to learn from his own actions. So a couple of times hungry, a couple of times having to sit out PE, a couple of times having to wear his uniform in the car, and that child won't do it again. No lectures, no punishments, no I told you so's, just the natural consequence of the action. And that works all the way up until adulthood. It's not until parents allow children to learn from their mistakes and let their experiences be their own teacher that the child learns responsibility. The more a child is bailed out and rescued and lectured time and time again, the more these precious les lessons go to waste. So this is one amazing gem that I feel that is reverberated again and again in a lot of his sermons. He talks about ex the value of experience. Of course, dangerous things like drugs or reprehensible characteristics or bad habits and the like don't need to be directly experienced to know they're bad. That's when he says, learning from others' experience. He constantly advises his children and companions to watch people's actions and learn from them. He says, if you find loathsome, objectionable, objectionable habits in others, abstain from developing those traits in yourself. If you're satisfied or feel happy in receiving a certain kind of behavior from others, you may feel confident in behaving with others in exactly the same way. So what beautiful advice is that? Watch people, watch their interactions, watch how they behave in society, learn from their mistakes, but do not judge them. I love how he encourages his sons to travel and see the world and its sites and ruins. He says in the same letter to him, see the ruined cities, the dilapidated palaces, 
decaying signs and relics of fallen empires of past nations, then meditate over the activities of these people. What have they done while they were alive and when they were in power? What did they achieve? From where did they start their careers? Where and when and how were they brought to an end? What did they actually gain out of life? And what was their contribution to human welfare? So again, he uses the tool of experience and observation to teach his children. It's almost with a childlike fascination that he sits and watches the ant, or admires and draws valuable lessons from the peacock or the solar system. He encourages children and people around him to question. He says knowledge is stored in safe houses whose key is the question. He encouraged them and us to ask why, to reflect and ponder. Another thing I love about the way he teaches in the same sermon is the way he illustrates and paints a picture to make it easier to grasp difficult principles, such as the benefits of charity, for example. It's very difficult to explain to a young child why parting with something that they love, parting with pocket money that they've sa saved up and giving it away, why is that better? It's very difficult to sh teach them that you will, sow in the you will reap in the hereafter what you sow here, when the hereafter is something that they can't taste, smell, touch, anything. But the way he explains it is so beautiful. He says about giving charity, and please make a note of this when you donate for the Salam Center. If you find around you such poor, needy, and destitute people who are willing to carry your load for you as far as the Day of Judgment, then consider this to be an opportunity. Enlist them and pass the burden on to them. He means distribute your wealth among them and help others to the best of your ability as load carriers for you. Thus, you will relieve yourself of the heavy responsibility of having to answer for these things, and you will not have an account on the Day of Judgment and you'll arrive at the end of your journey fresh and light, having enough provision for you. He says, have as many weight carriers as you can. That means help as many as you can, so that you, might, you may not miss them when you very badly need them. Remember that everything you give out in charity is a loan that will be paid back to you when you are the most poor and destitute. So it's important to explain such concepts to children in a way that they can understand, because children by nature are selfish, man by nature is altruistic. He may give out of pity or feeling sorry for the gaunt, malnourished African face he sees on the screen, but eventually he becomes hardened to it. He may give to causes after extensive research into how, whether they deserve it or not. But ultimately, he's motivated the most when there's something in it for him. And when man understands that the main beneficiary of his charity is himself, that he's the one who stands to profit the most from giving, then he'll give freely and generously. And that's a very valuable lesson to teach children from young. And you'll see in this letter, even though Brother Imran Ali went into it in detail in light of education systems, there's actually no principle or moral virtue or valuable lesson that Imam Ali salam, has left out to include as a parent. But unfortunately, we don't have time to go into all of it. But he teaches him about self-control, about anger management, about when to talk and when to remain silent, about bullying and never to tyrannize people, about when to stand up for people who are bully, being bullied and how to stand up for people who are bully, being bullied, about when to assert yourself and have self-esteem and when to display humility. He teaches him the importance of choosing good friends. And he's so specific in his advice about choosing good friends actually listing and making clear to him exactly what types of people to befriend and exactly what types of people to avoid becoming too close to. And these are all valuable parenting lessons that both seasoned parents and new parents alike can learn from Imam Ali al-Islam's advice to his son. And these were just a couple of such gems that have impacted me and stood out to me. But letter 31 of Nahjul Balaghi is a condensed course in parenting using true and real divine morals and virtues. And as we learn from this spiritual father's teachings, confident that unlike self-professed parenting experts, he actually knew what he was doing. So we can stand there confident and implore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all the tawfiq, to be able to first implement these virtues ourselves and then be exemplary parents and pass them on to our children, inshallah, through his grace. 
وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Following the footsteps of Imam Ali Guided by Imam Ali in spirituality by Muhammad Raza Tajri يا غياث المستغيثين يا حبيب قلوب الصادقين ويا إله العالمين دعاء كميل أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد بن عبد الله وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الأرجاس وطهرهم من الأدناس وجعل مودتهم أجرا على الناس Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum Just to initiate this uh, short discussion, I'd like to repeat the sentiment of some of the previous speakers that this colossal personality of Imam Ali alayhi salam to speak about his spirituality for someone like myself, as ignorant as myself and then to do that in about 10 minutes is uh, a task impossible but if we begin to look at how spirituality or Islamic spirituality is discussed in circles of learning or even academic circles then we find that groups or individuals who are characterized by spirituality or mysticism or have some sort of esoteric inclination more often than not the majority of the times they are somehow no matter what denomination of Islam they belong to they are somehow linked and choose to be linked and associated back with our first Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Even if we like Sufism, which is considered to be the spiritual strand of, uh, of Islam, rightly or wrongly is not our discussion here, but as even though this uh, sect or denomination is seen to be that which uh, discusses spirituality and, and esoteric teachings, away from the other denominations. Even this we find many or the majority of the chains within Sufism try to link themselves back from student to teacher to his teacher to his teacher back to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And if that is not possible, then we find in mysticism that what they even have resorted to doing is linking themselves back to a teacher which may, they may have been separated by with a hundred years. This teacher died here and the student sprang 100 years later. How is that possible? Why? Because they want to link themselves back to that chain which leads to Imam Ali alayhi salam. And they call this Rabata or Ilaqa Uwaisiya. That they're linked to this teacher who lived a long time ago in the Uwaisi method. Referring obviously to Uwais ibn, uh, Uwais ibn Amir ibn Juz ibn Malak ibn Amr al-Qarani who obviously we know is always Al-Qarani. Why? Because when he came to meet the Holy Prophet, and then he went back without meeting the Holy Prophet, we all know the story, when the Prophet returned to his hometown, he said, what's that scent I smell? And he was told it was the person who came to meet him. The fact that Uwais was somehow spiritually linked to the Holy Prophet without meeting him, without seeing him, is what is trying to be reflected here in these chains that this teacher and student are linked somehow even across time, even without seeing or experiencing each other's uh, presence. Why? Because they want to somehow link themselves to Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Even in this, if we look at uh, mysticism, the teacher or the peer, as in, in some, uh, some circles, is known as some of these uh, denominations look at that individual as the qutb, the pole or the axis around which they rotate. Obviously in Shia Islam, the, the Qutb is always none other than the Ma'asum Imam. But even in other denominations of Islam, they say that the Qutb can be this teacher or this teacher, but the ultimate Qutb is Ali ibn Abi Talib. No, no one else, alayhi salam. 
However, moving away from how Islam is studied, coming back to the way we live, away from the academic sphere, it's impossible to compartmentalize the spirituality or the spiritual aspect of the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam and analyze that in contrast with the other aspects of his life. For us, it's possible that, what's, what do you do for your financial life? Or oh, I work here, 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 and I earn this much. What do you do about your familial life, your domestic life? Well, I always make sure we eat dinner together and I spend some time with my children doing their homework, this and that, so my domestic life is looked after. What about your social life? I do this. What about your spiritual life? Well, I recite this dua on Thursdays or I pray this many extra prayers. And that's what I do for my spiritual life. Our lives are categorized somehow in this way. However, the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam was not this way. What we do, we imply that our financial life is not part of our spiritual life, therefore. Or our familial life is not part of our work life. And all of that is not part of the spiritual life. But no, it's difficult to cut that off and look at Imam Ali alayhi salam, just his spiritual life. Because if we look at spirituality in the meaning of attempting to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by looking at the inner and the outer of all aspects, then his life was a holistic one. We heard about parenting. His parenting was not separate from his spiritual life. It was not separate that he does this for his children, but he does this to get closer to Allah. No. All of that was one and together. His battles that he fought, the charity that he gave, was not different from his spiritual life. And therefore, this personality as a whole, when we look at it, we find that writers like Raza Shah Kazmi from the Ismaili Institute says, to speak of Ali ibn Abi Talib is to speak of the quintessential spirituality of the Islamic tradition. That he was Islamic spirituality. Why? Why does he say such a thing? Why do we have this sentiment coming from people? Because when we look at the ahadith and we find the spiritual position or the spiritual standing of Imam Ali alayhi salam, yeah, we can look at what Raza Shah Kazmi says or what this writer says or what that writer says. But when we look at the words of none other than Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Then we find that really the spiritual position of Imam Ali alayhi salam, although we cannot fathom it, we can have some idea about it. Anna wa Aliyun min shajaratin wahida. Myself and Ali are from one tree. Obviously, spiritually looking at such a statement, meaning the same roots, the same branches, the same fruit, the same strong bark. Aliyun minni wa ana min Ali. Ali is from me and I am from Ali. Skeptics may look at this kind of tradition and say, well, obviously that means they're from the same tribe, they're from the same family, they were first cousins after all, so same blood, everything. Fine. This narration is a bit more difficult to doubt its spiritual effect or its spiritual uh, significance. Ali minni bi manzilati ra'si min badani. Ali is to me as my own head is to the rest of my body. Even more of a spiritual significance. Sahibu Sirri, the custodian of my inner mystery, the custodian of my secret. Sahibu Sirri Ali ibn Abi Talib. That the one who holds this spiritual thing that others don't know about is this person. And because of all of this, obviously, uh, he also said, Zikru Aliyin. Ibadah, to mention this person, to mention him and to discuss him, is an act of worship. The spiritual practices of Ali alayhi salam. How did he talk about himself? It was me, I am the one who made the world insignificant or disparaged it, moved away from it, me. As we know, the other famous narration from him, Ya dunya ghurri ghayri. O oh world, try and deceive other than me. You won't deceive me. Such a standing he reached that because of this kind of spiritual embodiment that he was, he became that person who could say truthfully, "Ana qasim Allah bayn al jannati wa nar." I am the criteria of Allah by which He decides who to put into heaven and who to put into hell. 
أنا عروة الله الوثقى I'm that firm handle of Allah وكلمة التقوى and that word of taqwa it is me however we're not here just to enlist his spiritual credentials as we in 10 minutes or whatever time we have left we can't do this what inspiration can we take from his life after all that's why we're here when we discuss the spiritual aspects of his life we try to draw him as a benchmark because that's what he was made by when the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said Ya Ali Law laka Lama'uriful mu'minuna ba'di Oh Ali Had it not been for you The believers after me Would not be known Would not be recognized Again Historically speaking People have come with the Interpretation of such words That whoever was In favor of Ali ibn Abi Talib They were the believers Whoever was against him They were the disbelievers And that's how the Prophet meant That the believers are recognized Fine, but look what he says Had it not been for you The believers would not be recognized after me Meaning he is the benchmark Whoever follows these principles Whoever follows these principles Can be called a mu'min, a believer And therefore when we try to enhance our spiritual selves We're looking at some aspects of his life Obviously, as we said, we cannot fathom Or even begin to think about where he stood spiritually but we can aspire to inculcate some aspects of his life or just to see where, how lofty it was so that we can hit towards that. And to close, therefore, I want to just take one narration from the life of our fourth holy Imam Ali Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam. So the narration says, Min Ali ibn al-Husayn alayhi salam. From our fourth holy Imam, وَلَقَدْ دَخَلَ أَبُوْ جَعْفَرٍ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ إِبْنُهُ عَلَيْهِ His son, Imam Muhammad Baqir alayhi salam, entered into his presence. فَإِذَا هُوَ قَدْ بَلَغَ مِنَ الْعِبَادَةِ مَا لَمْ يَبْلُغُ أَحَدٍ When he entered into the presence of his father, the fourth holy imam, he saw him that as if he had performed so much worship that no one had reached that level of worship. فرآه, so he saw his father فرآه قد اصفر لونه من السهر He saw him that his face had turned pale out of staying up at night in worship ورمصت عيناه من البكاء His eyes had turned whitish due to the profuse weeping in the way of Allah ودبرت جبهته وانخزم أنفه من السجود His forehead and his nose had been worn away due to the amount of prostration he was performing. Imagine the scene here. Fifth Imam Ma'asum alayhi salam is looking at his father, fourth Imam alayhi salam, this much worship he's carrying out. وَوَرِمَتْ سَاقَاهُ وَقَدَمَاهُ مِنَ الْقِيَامِ فِي الصَّلَاةِ His calves of his legs and his feet had swollen up due to the amount he used to stand in the prayer. وَقَالَ أَبُوْ جَعْفَرَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Fifth Imam is relating now. فَلَمْ أَمْلِكْ حِينَ رَأَيْتُهُ بِتِلْكَ الْحَالِ الْبُكَاءِ When I saw him in this way, his face like this, his eyes like this, his feet like this, his nose and forehead like this, I couldn't control myself but weep. Why? فَبَكَيْتُ رَحْمَةً لَهُ I wept out of pity for this man, for my father, he's saying. فَالْتَفَتَ إِلَيَّ بَعْدَ هَنِيهَةٍ مِنْ دُخُولِي So after I entered sometime, he looked at me, my father is saying, fourth imam looked at me, فَقَالْ And he said, يَا بُنَيَّ Oh my son, أَعْطِنِي بَعْضَ تِلْكَ الصُّحُفْ أَلَّتِي فِيهَا عِبَادَةْ عَلِيُّ بْنُ أَبِي طَالِبْ Bring me those papers, some of those papers, bring me those pages that have listed on it the worship of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Bring me those papers. فَأَعْطَيْتُهُ So I gave them to him. فَقَرَأَ فِيهَا شَيْئًا يَسِيرًا So he read from those things, just a small few lines, maybe just a small bit. ثُمَّ تَرَكَهَا مِنْ يَدِهِ تَضَجُّرًا مِنْهَا Then he just left them. He read just a few lines out of them. Then he just left them out of exhaustion. وَقَالْ And then he expressed... مَنْ يَقْوَى عَلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ عَلِيِّ بْنِ أَبِي طَالِبَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ 
He said, who is it that can reach that level or surpass that level of worship of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam? The man, Ma'asum, who we know as As-Sajjad, the one who prostrated a lot, the one who we know as Zayn al-Abideen, the jewel of the worshippers. His son is saying that after my father came from this hours of long worship with a pale face and white eyes and a worn away nose and forehead and swollen feet and swollen calves, after I cried out of pity for him, that's much, how much he had worshipped, he asked me for some lines of Imam Ali's worship and he said, who can reach that level of worship? So for us today, obviously we can't even begin to look at the worship of Imam Ali alayhi salam. But we, as, when we look at that, it should be some sort of inspiration that we have to get much higher than where we stand presently. And secondly, try to intermingle one aspect of our life into the other that our parenting or our giving of charity or our learning or our teaching or our working is not separate from our spiritual lives. Imam Ali al-Islam was not like that. His entire life was spiritual. And therefore it's very difficult to just look at one aspect of his life in that spiritual way and cut it off and sever it from the other aspects of his life. So on that note, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us a tawfiq to learn from all the speakers today from the life and the footsteps, as we said, of Imam Ali alayhi salam that we may become closer to the Almighty. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَ أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى مُحَمَّدُ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدُ We move on with uh, next up is uh, Brother Murtaza Bandali uh, with a Qasida. So can we welcome him with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Adhalu <laughs> al-salat Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Ali, 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 Ali Ali, 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 خدا کے بعد میرے لب پہ ہے سنائے مصطفیٰ نبی محترم کے بعد مدھ شیر کیبریاں خدا ہے ذل جلال سے ملی ہے جن کو برتری علی 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 جب یہ علی 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 خدا کا وہ سفیر ہے رسول کا وزیر ہے وہ اولیاء کا پیر ہے وہ سب کا دستغیر ہے دعا عجیب رئیل ہے وہ جوشن کبیر ہے وہ سب کا غم غسار ہے وہ شافعی کے ہم بلی علی 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 دلوں میں ہے نظر میں ہے شبوں میں ہے سہر میں ہے عدب کی منزلوں میں ہے قیام میں سفر میں ہے فضا میں ہے گھٹا میں ہے نجوم میں قمر میں ہے 
उसी से दिन को रोशनी उसी से शब को चांदनी अली 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 चलो चलो गदीर में जहाँ है जश्न एक बपा उतर के आ गए जहाँ फल से सारे अम्बिया अली बनाए जा रहे है जान शीन मुस्तफा जमी पे क्या फलक में भी है आज जश्न है दरी अली 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 है खुश अली सदफ अली गोहर अली रसूल की सिपर अली जफर का है जबर अली यहाँ अली वहाँ अली इधर अली उधर अली इसी का नाम आ गया फतह की बात जब चली अली 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 बियाली मुह मदीन और नजल की तबू 
أفضل الصلاة محمد وآل محمد رحم الله مكرسورة مباركة الفاتحة